Okay, so good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and very welcome to our panel discussion on the topic of uh, uh, women philosophers and the canon. Um, I'm very happy to host uh, this event, not to host, but to moderate this event. My name is Sabrina Ebersmeyer. I'm Associate Professor for History of Philosophy of the University of Copenhagen. And I'm very happy for the invitation to be here. Um, so concerning the procedure, I suggest the following. I will firstly introduce the panelists individually, um, so you know who they are. Then I will ask them a question uh, individually so that ca they have the opportunity to give a very brief statement concerning their position. And then we open up the discussion uh, to the wider audience. And you're welcome to comment and to share with us your uh, observations um, or to ask questions uh, to the panelists. Um, Okay, so I would say, uh, gentlemen first. <laughs> um, thank you very much, uh, um, Professor Dieter Birnbacher. He's uh, 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 thank you very much for being here. He's a professor emeritus uh, of the University of Düsseldorf. Um, uh, he is uh, a very uh, influential and important figure in German philosophy, uh, not just on the academic level, but also on the political level, as he uh, was, um, in addition to his academic duties, also part, or probably still is, member of several um, academic societies related to the um, implementation of scientific research, of philosophical research, and, and policy making. Uh, in society, especially concerning his main area of competency, ethics uh, and applied ethics, ethics of medicine, philosophy of mind, uh, th uh, theory of action, and also Schopenhauer, as I learned. <laughs> um, so very welcome. Um, yeah, we don't. Ha yeah, we can clap, but then we have to clap all the time. We can also <laughs> clap at the end. Uh, once we are done with the, all of us, um, um, I'm also um, very happy to uh, introduce to you uh, pr um, Professor Emerita um, Mariana Nguyen, who is Professor Emerita from the Hochschule um, Merseburg. Um, her areas of competencies um, are um, uh, the philosophy, um, uh, the history of philosophy, in particular, of course, ancient philosophy and women philosophers in ancient times, but also social and political philosophy and ethics and phil philosophy of uh, culture. And uh, she did, did this very great job of publishing a huge amount of articles in the in, in German Encyclopedia for philosophy uh, for women philosophers, where she covered, I think, more than 40 woman philosophers from antiquity with an, an uh, lexical entry. Um, so um, Maria Nuhl uh, writes uh, concerning uh, our topic here, um, the um, philosophy and the canon. I think in, in the philosophy program, uh, lectures and seminars uh, on women philosophers should be a matter of course. Um, and second, philosophical um, debates refer to the Lebenswelt and to the the world uh, we live in, and this is shaped by the distinctive features of men and women, and therefore these different per perspectives should also be represented in philosophical discussions, especially when it comes to values. So very welcome. Um, I go further to uh, Sarah Hatton. Um, uh, Sarah, um, uh, of course, known to most of you who work already on the history of women philosophers, uh, is a honorary visiting professor at the moment at the University of York. Um, previously, she taught at several um, universities in England and hold various fellowships and, and visiting professorships all over uh, Europe. Her main uh, research focuses uh, on the history of early modern philosophy, especially 17th century um, uh, British philosophy, and, and she has also a special interest in the Cambridge Platonists, and of course in Anne Conway, what we all uh, know about. So she is, um, among all the things uh, that she's been doing, um, uh, maybe I mention only her uh, re-edition of uh, Marjorie Nicholson's Conway Letters, um, which is an important source to investigate uh, in Conway's um, philosophy. Um, Sarah says about women and the canon, I quote, when thinking about the women philosophers and the canon, we need to ask not only why the canon and which canon, but also importantly, what method. Philosophy asks questions, it is not a collection of dogmas. I propose a conversational uh, conversation model which respects historical context. Quote end. Very welcome, uh, Sarah. 
And now I come, of course, to Ruth, which is very, very awkward <laughs> to introduce uh, Ruth Hagengruber. I will do so anyhow. So, of course, as uh, we all know, Ruth is a professor uh, for philosophy here at the University uh, of Paderborn. And more importantly, she is the director and the founder of, uh, of this very great center for the history of women philosophers um, and scientists. Um, all of us who know Ruth know how much energy she has. <laughs> I don't know where she takes it from. <laughs> um, to be everywhere and to give all these lectures, to launch all these events, organizing workshops, um, and among others, also that wonderful summer school. So I think we could take this opportunity to thank Ruth uh, for taking up this summer school. Um, Concerning her uh, academic merits uh, and, and uh, the study of women philosophers, of course, uh, um, uh, Ruth is uh, most famous for her work on Emilie du Châtelet, but she also uh, recently published together with um, uh, Sarah Hutton uh, a special issue of the British Journal uh, for the History of Philosophy dedicated to, uh, to early one, uh, woman uh, philosophers. Um, uh, concerning um, uh, uh, Ruth's perspective on the topic, I will quote her, maybe not uh, by word, but I think uh, the sense is quite what you think. <laughs> um, uh, I, I quote or from my memory, there have always been and are everywhere women philosophers, <laughs> and you just have to look out for them. So uh, I think we can start from here, and now I would uh, just give our panelists first uh, the opportunity just to make some comments and statements and just express their view um, on the topics. And, and I might start with Dieter Birnbacher. Yeah, take yeah, I, started, I started to think about women as philosophers in reading Descartes and uh, seeing that his woman uh, um, uh, correspondence partners had very acute ideas, critical, critical of his own philosophy. He was really so stunned that he didn't know what to answer because these criticisms were far too good uh, for him to answer. I mean, the weaknesses were, uh, ob obviously these weaknesses were discovered and exposed. And that is uh, something I noticed with several women colleagues in my uh, subject, that they are much more daring to uh, speak their mind and to call a spade a spade and <laughs> to, uh, to, to uh, set things straight without um, circumlocution and without, without excuse. And I think this is a very important uh, healthy impl influence on, for example, the uh, dialogues and conversations in a lot of faculties. But what um, my special relation to women philosophers is, is by John Stuart Mill and Harriet Taylor, because I'm just editing the um, important uh, and seminal text, The Subjection of Women, which stands at the beginning of a long series of, of uh, writings, not by uh, philosophers, but by many others, uh, promoting the issue of equal rights for women. In those days, um, the equal rights in politics, uh, the vote was uh, primarily of interest, but of course the visions of these two people, John Stuart Mill and Harriet Taylor, and most ideas come from Harriet Taylor, as I have found, um, are uh, of a daring, visionary character stretching uh, over centuries and far from being uh, fully recognized and especially far from being realized in our times. Uh, it is in fact an agenda which has partly been realized but contains a lot of things that remain to be done. And this is true of our societies and worldwide um, the agenda is uh, much larger, so that we see in our, uh, on, from a global perspective, I think of some uh, third world countries, conditions which are not so much different from what these Victorians uh, criticized in their own very narrow-minded and restrictive um, uh, society, which was from that the standards of the time, a very well-to-do society, full of technical scientific progress, which, however, 
these people saw as being limited. They didn't recognize this as an actual progress. The progress for them was a progress in human rights, in equality, in education, and especially in equality of chances, in education, in getting jobs, in being socially recognized. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this statement and for um, uh, putting our attention back to uh, the critical voice uh, that is, uh, could be heard again if we listen more to women philosophers and also to all the work that is still waiting for us. Just a small issue, um, comment here on the language issue. So this uh, uh, debate was announced in German, so we now decided to uh, do it bilingual. So if you are German and you uh, you know, don't, don't feel comfortable in asking or commenting or make your statements in, Ger in English, you just do it in German and we will then translate, right? And I go give a further to Maria. Gut, das war die Einleitung, dass ich jetzt Deutsch sprechen darf, <lacht> weil mein Englisch einfach nicht gut genug ist und ich nehme es weg, damit also die Störgebrüche auch äh, nicht mehr da sind. Okay, ähm, ja, was ich zu sagen habe, erstmal zum Kanon, so brauchen wir diesen Kanon überhaupt und wenn ja, welche Gegenstandsbereiche werden denn aufgenommen, wer bestimmt sie? Mein Anliegen wäre es eben auch die äh, Lebenswelt der Frau, die einfach immer noch auch heute und immer wieder auch äh, eine andere zum Teil äh, ist, als, als äh, die Lebenswelt des Mannes mit einzubeziehen und also von daher auch ja, die Bedeutung von Erziehung mit aufzunehmen äh, in den äh, ja, in die Ethik und äh, einfach die, diesen Perspektivwechsel dann auch vorzunehmen. Das wäre so der eine Punkt, die Lebenswelt der Menschen mit aufzunehmen. So wäre es eigentlich richtig gesagt. Dann das Zweite, in meiner Forschungsarbeit äh, über Philosophien der griechischen Antike bin ich immer wieder äh, darauf gestoßen, dass in den Fachlexika, dass in der Fachliteratur, einfach nicht korrekt berichtet wird. Ich habe das heute Morgen auch in meinem Beitrag schon gesagt, wenn also im neuen Paroli aus dem Jahr dann 1999, 2000 immer noch steht, äh, jetzt in Bezug auf Femonoe als Beispiel, dass sie äh, die Tochter des Apollon war, dann ist es falsch, sondern sie wurde die Tochter des Apollon genannt und das bedeutet, sie war Priesterin. Und wenn es so aber steht, Tochter des Apoll, dann bedeutet es, sie ist eine mythische Gestalt, sie ist keine historische Persönlichkeit. Und das immer noch 2000 aufgelegt. Oder bei Cleobuline, jetzt die äh, zur vorsokratischen Zeit gehört, zur Zeit der Spruchweisheiten, äh, wenn wir Einmal tatsächlich diesen Antrag finden Kleobuline und dann ein Pfeil, Verweis auf Kleobulus, ihren Vater, okay. Bei Kleobulus taucht der Name Kleobuline nicht mehr auf, sondern dann den weiteren Verweis auf die Spruchweisheiten und auch dort taucht ihr Name nicht mehr auf. Man läuft einfach ins Leere. Also, dass einfach die Fachliteratur korrekter arbeitet. Okay, Gut. Briefly um, uh, translate uh, the two points uh, uh, made by Maria. So the first is uh, uh, so questioning, do we actually need a canon? Uh, and if we do so, uh, which canon is it? Um, she thinks that, um, that the perspective uh, of women or the way of living of a woman is still different nowadays, also from that of men. And it has been in, his, in, in, in historical terms, evidently it has been different and it is important to give voice and uh, also to this other perspective uh, on, on the world. Um, and that's also why she thinks we have to take seriously education, education of girls, uh, uh, and, and to take this uh, seriously as a philosophical uh, topic. Her other point relates more specifically to ancient women philosophers and she laments the fact that uh, uh, also the research literature has a lot of faults and errors when it comes to, us, to reports about women philosophers. And there are in, in the German-speaking world some very important standard uh, works, for instance, um, Der Neue Pauli, that is this standard work, uh, when it comes to ancient times as such, uh, and but still, if you look up women philosophers, you find all these errors uh, that 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 are still reported in, in you know in, in, in today's time, and, and it's uh, well, it's time now to change this and to be appropriate and correct, and up to date research in also in the standard accounts. Okay, um, so we go further to um, Sarah. Entschuldigung, dass ich will auf Englisch sprechen. Um, ich spreche nur wenig Deutsch, es ist besser, wenn ich Englisch spreche. So, um, I had to face this 
an equivalent problem to the, the canonical problems we've been talking about when I was putting together a proposal for the history of British philosophy, which I um, published two years ago with um, OUP. The marvelous thing about OUP was they said, when they asked me to do this, I said, I don't do Locke Barclay Hume type British philosophy. And they said to me, we wouldn't have asked you if, they, if you did. Um, do, you know, up to you, you, you tell us how you'd like to do it. And that was, that was actually a huge headache. Um, but I was determined to make sure women were represented. Um, and I was, but I, not just women, I was determined that it wouldn't just be the canonical people. Um, and if you cut off, your cut off in the 17th century, is the 17th century, it doesn't, Barclay's not there, neither is Hume, of course, but um, another rather under under uh, valued philosopher, of course, is Hobbes, although we consider him canonical. I mean, in, in Britain, of all places, Hobbes is treated as a political scientist and not as a philosopher. Um, and Bacon, uh, Francis Bacon is treated as a, um, a, a, as a scientist, again, as a, the, you know, he's another of these patriarchal fathers of uh, narratives. So I decided to make sure that Bacon and Hobbes were in there as philosophers um, and, um, and made various decisions like that, but to put in the other people that they were in conversation with. So I adopted a conversation model, to, uh, which after all is how philosophy most of the time happens. People, people write it down after the conversation is over, but it, it, our philosophy is, is, is normally a, a, a practice of discussion and debate and um, uh, uh, arguing with each other. Um, so I adopted that model, and um, that was helpful for inserting women in it. So um, I put Anne Conway in conversation with, I put the, Cam I put the Cambridge Platonists in there as, as uh, I put minor figures, so, soi disant minor figures like the Cambridge Platonists in there, Anne Conway in conversation. Locke's in there, Damaris Masham, Catherine Trotter, Coburn in conversation. So that's how they, they, they managed to fit them in. Of course, and Margaret Cavendish too, um, uh, in conversation with Hobbes. Um, but, but other things as well. So um, that, that's, that, the, that, the, the, the risk though is that even within that model, the, the, the women look as though it's, could still look as though it's the, the guys leading the, 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 taking the lead. But I hope that I managed to write it in such a way that that, that didn't occur. What I am very aware of is that with all the work that now is being done, and all the work that's going to come out, I hope of all you people, as you recover all these women, is that the book will very soon be out of date because I, there will be many, many more women to put in there and I will be criticized for not having done, put in enough. Well, that, I look forward to that criticism because it will mean that um, more women have been, been, been put in the picture. Yeah. Um Thank you, Sarah. Uh, and I think that's already you know, uh, one model that we could discuss all in the discussion. This uh, conversation model is this an alternative uh, to the traditional canon where we jump from big figure to big figure. Yeah. Okay. The last is. Um, uh, yeah. And um, I'm not sure if it is adequate how I would like to introduce my work and uh, access to this, but uh, I like to take the opportunity to tell you something about myself, because I think it is, um, it has been decisive for me also to find my methodological approach to the history of women philosophers. And some of you know the story already, because I'm continuously telling it, that about the age of 12, I know it quite exactly because I found the book from my sister for, uh, on Simone de Beauvoir, uh, talked aus Guppenhauser, I don't remember the original title, but I read it in German. And I thought, oh, I'm an intelligent girl, so where do I go to? So, and then I wrote to the Vatican, and I said, I have metaphysical power, and I think this is the place I have to go to, you need people of metaphysical power. And this is still what I thought very often when I'm discussing also with my uh, sister. So, so, and we discuss that now, 
uh, on the end of religion, you know, because I'm asking myself, when will philosophy be able to establish itself to this um, metaphysical demonstration and representation, which is, I would say, abused also in this institution of the personalized male God and so on, which is a theologically and philosophical wrong representation, as we all know, and no theologian would deny that. So this was my initial approach to go there and say, okay, I'm metaphysically talented, and we were three sisters, and so, and I didn't feel, you know, even in school, and so I didn't feel myself, however, subjected to something. So I was proud of myself, and I thought I have a certain way to go. And then when I started, I then understood that I had to study philosophy instead of theology. So I started philosophy, and I did Plato. I started with Plato. And I, it was natural that Plato started with a female teacher. It was evident. It was, it was no surprise. This was my world. And th this was how the world confirmed my expectations into the world. So it took me a long time to understand that this world means something different and claims something different than my experience expected from the world. So I think, and this is really an experience or an access to the world and to the metaphysical world, which is in contrary to others who say, uh, so, oh, my, my life has been always, I have been always being neglected, subjected, and so on. Because it was, I only slowly and very late have learned that the world and the majority of people claim something different. And so, uh, yeah, and so I, I think this is methodologically, this is indeed the fact that I say, okay, the world is somehow in a cave. It is running after majority and there is an established majority which holds women are not like that. When I'm hearing you uh, today, it was wonderful when Maria Newland spoke on and said, the idea of Gnoti Seoton is has been ascribed primarily to uh, Pomone. And, you know, and I find so many confirmation on this, on a kind of original um, intuition. And I thought at my beginning, and this is something when I started to work on Du Châtelet, I thought, um, you know, the women who are deprived from their pride and subject themselves, this is something what I can't understand. Because I think women are thinking creatures and taking over the idea that culture, and which is culturally yeah, posed over you to, to find you in a place where you think, okay, I should take that, it's perhaps better to take that over. And so I was, you know, and this is what my idea, there have always been women, what you have quoted at the beginning, there have always been women, because there have always been women as thinking creatures. And this is what I very much rediscover reading the women philosophers. So my question is now, and what are the times, because it's figured out that there are only certain epochs that claim that women have to be subjected, and the question is why. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, I might uh, grasp the opportunity also to add some thoughts <laughs> because I also have a view on this. I want to go into details, but I think there are certain ch uh, set, uh, challenges when it comes to the canon. The one is, um, do we take the patterns? I mean, these patterns that we are following in the history of philosophy, they don't originate it, you know, yesterday. They have a long history behind and they're kind of perpetuated. They are laid down in, in the way we edit works, which work we edited, you, which works were translated, how um, lexica and encyclopedias are organized, so it's a huge world. So to reconstruct and reshape this takes a huge effort and probably different approaches, right? But there are uh, several about and I'm always wondering if I'm a bit too moderate, you know, I'm, a, I'm from Hamburg, so we don't, <laughs> we don't do things in a rush. <laughs> we have been, um, so for instance, in my bachelor class, I introduced I just more or less took over a curriculum and then introduced two women to this curriculum, uh, Elizabeth of Bohemia and Mary Wollstonecraft. And of course, one could, for instance, object, well, 
uh, you haven't changed a lot, right? <laughs> because you have just a token woman on your syllabus. And, and the rest is just, just you perpetuate the same assumptions concerning Kant and Hegel and so on, which I don't uh, affect. Well, I think that could be countered. But still, I think, uh, should we go this way, right? Should we just moderately uh, change curricula as long as we go? Or should we just all, you know, all of us go on strike and say, no, <laughs> no, stop. We don't follow that. We, we, we create our own histories. So I think there are various ways around uh, and, and uh, approachable. And, and you are very welcome now to, uh, to comment and ask questions to our panelists or to ask questions uh, concerning these statements. Yeah? So, um, thank you all very much for your comments and your Do you want to take the mic? So thank you very much for your comments and reflections. Ja, vielen Dank. Uh, I have the hunch, and maybe I'm wrong, but that the idea of the canon as a kind of linear synthetic story is uh, we can't believe that anymore. <laughs> so I'm wondering, so for if you think of the beginning of the 20th century, the, the, how science really just rocked philosophy uh, across um, the world, uh, certainly in the Western world, and uh, philosophy had to rethink itself and then recreated a kind of new story, a new narrative. And so I'm wondering whether any of you have any reflections about the role of crises from outside philosophy that force philosophy to rethink itself historically. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Start sorry. 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 No. I'm happy to start with a response because I think uh, I think the history of, of philosophy, as I try to figure out, as a history also of violation, you know. So I think that the history of philosophy indeed reflects this as the institutionalized history many acts of violence in this. And I think to renew philosophy. So I always would hold that uh, bringing in the women philosophers means to free the history of philosophy from these acts of violence from the outside. And uh, so this is how I would take that. I think a problem is uh, exactly what you said, that there is a line of tradition which is extremely conservative and always um, takes the same people, the same big names uh, in its tradition because they happen to be there and they have a very, very um, a good reputation. So everyone is quoting them, every, uh, everyone is referring to them and bolstering his, uh, his own arguments with references to them. So in Germany, traditionally, you can use Kant, Kant for this purpose uh, quite, quite uh, willfully. You can n nobilitize any argument you have in referring it back to some of these big names. Um, I, I'm very well aware of the Kantian tradition, which knows a number of women philosophers, for example, Greta Hermann, uh, Henry Hermann, uh, who is rather little known, but he, she was a correspondent with many important physicists at that time. She was a matician physicist and worked in the tradition of Leonard Nelson, and it took um, uh, about 50 years to he read, now, yeah, to recover, to recover uh, the, the the extreme value of her work, and um, I'm I belong to that academy, um, uh, which is now trying to edit uh, in a number of volumes the, the book. But of course, these are social prejudices which spread <laughs> to the academic and to the intellectual sphere, and we see that every day that there is actual discrimination. Um, in quotation, for example, um, there have been tests uh, with anonymous articles sent to uh, very well-known journals, one with a female and one with a male, Christian names, for the same text. And there was a clear discrimination uh, visible because a female can't be 
or as good as, as a man. And in the uh, German uh, uh, Science Foundation, DFG, people had the good idea to limit the number of, um, number of uh, uh, published works to five in order to establish some equality of chances because women always had less publications than men. And this continues to be so for whatever reasons. This has nothing to do with quality. It has uh, just something to do with uh, ambition, with, with effort, and, and with uh, overusing one's resources. And of course, uh, conversation to exploit ideas of the members of one's uh, own staff uh, for one's own purposes. And of course, I mean, this was a very, very good step because there is now an equality um, of, of chances to a greater degree, it's not complete. But uh, these steps, I think, are very useful in, uh, in, uh, um, in achieving our common aim. Yeah, um, th thank you for the comments. I will just pass on the micro, micro but as I pass, <laughs> I might comment a bit. I think it's, um, it's a very interesting question concerning uh, taking up the term of crisis uh, that we face because I think it is a fact well, that we have a huge discussion in, 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 in society uh, taking up new momentum with the Me Too movement, which, uh, which is you know, found everywhere in society. And that also has an impact on philosophy and uh, does a lot of political pressure. And my feeling is that is important <laughs> to have this pressure from without, because from within, of course, things change, but so slowly, so extremely slowly. So, so, so th that's, this uh, political pressure helps us uh, in our effort. Gut, ich spreche wieder Deutsch. Ähm, mir geht es also zwei Punkte. Eigentlich jetzt die Öffnung der Philosophie auch für gegenwärtige Probleme, Krisen für gegenwärtige Thematiken. Also die Philosophie, so wie ich sie auch noch studiert habe und wie sie in der Lehre präsentiert wurde, war einfach in ihren eigenen, äh, in ihrer eigenen Geschichte gefangen. So fünf Platon-Seminare äh, in der Ober Oberstufen sozusagen. Es blieb in sich gefangen. Und, aber die Philosophie hat sich schon langsam geöffnet, aber noch bei weitem nicht genug, einfach auf die Gegenwart sich auch zu beziehen in der Lehre, im universitären Bereich. Das wäre der eine Punkt. Der zweite Punkt, äh, was Sie auch ansprachen, nämlich äh, man kann immer wieder so sich auf Kant berufen, man kann die Klassiker nehmen und so weiter. Wenn ich versucht habe, jetzt in Seminaren ein Grundlagenwerk oder ein Sammelband zu nehmen, um sozusagen jetzt im Bereich der Ethik dann äh, Texte zu nehmen, dann gibt es diese wunderbaren Sammelbände. Von Ihnen habe ich dann auch noch selber mit studiert. Ähm, Birnbacher Hörster, Texte der Ethik. So. Und es, also bis zum heutigen Tag, es finden sich keine Texte von Frauen in diesen Sammelbänden. Und ich denke, wir müssen auf die Verlage zugehen, auf die, die, die Lektoren zugehen, dass einfach die Texte auf, aufgenommen werden von Frauen mit Erläuterung oder mit, mit dem Kontext, in dem sie stehen. Weil in der Lehre greifen wir einfach auf diese Bücher, auf diese Fachliteratur zurück. Und wenn wir sie in der Fachliteratur nicht haben, wir sie selbst erarbeiten müssen, dann ist das sehr viel aufwendiger. Und wir haben, oder jetzt, wenn wir wirklich in der Lehre stehen, haben wir nicht die Zeit, um dann noch zu recherchieren. Wir brauchen diese Literatur, in denen die Texte von Frauen, in denen die Namen von Frauen, die Biografien von Frauen, die, die Ideen, das alles mit enthalten sind, einfach in, einem ganz normalen, in der ganz normalen Fachliteratur. Dann können wir sie auch in der Lehre gut unterbringen. Um, I will try to translate. <laughs> so uh, Maria made two points. The first relates um, to uh, uh, the self-understanding of philosophy and, and the openness of philosophy towards society and contemporary problems. And she laments the fact that especially in German academic philosophy for a very long period philosophy took place in a so-called ivory tower, right? Where just the problems, especially in the history of philosophy, just refer to, to themselves and did not really reach out to the um, society we, uh, we live in and the problems we face in our daily life. And um, her other point, I was uh, referring back and taking up the, the point made uh, uh, by Dieter Birnbacher concerning uh, 
uh, the, the reference, uh, so, so you can uh, uh, give nobility to each thought <laughs> once you find a quote of Kant that is uh, appropriate. <laughs> so you have to be a big guy in the history, and, and then you you know you you push up yourself, <coughs> and, and and that's uh, why Maria made the point that we have to reach out actually to the publisher houses and uh, and, and make them. Um, yeah, more open to, to, to publish and make available uh, works of women philosophers in collections and in teaching materials, all these um, this textbooks you, you have uh, need for if you're giving a class uh, and, and in the usual uh, random textbooks, a woman uh, are completely uh, inappropriately underrepresented. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, Sarah. Um, uh, well, I work very narrowly on the 17th century and, well, early modern and scholarly and don't really think about the big questions as to whether one could, say, a, make a generalisation like you've just invited us. But um, I will say this, that I've always, um, I, I'm, I maintain more and more strongly that what passes for the history of philosophy among philosophers is not the history of philosophy. It is not historical. It is a narrative based for, uh, with, with, with uh, which has been put together for, 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 for a whole uh, uh, catalogue of reasons. Um, it's a plausible narrative in many ways. Um, um, but what really under Lines, uh, but really what's going on is it is the study of historical philosophers, a selection of historical philosophers who've been selected for re philosophical reasons, um, which perfectly, um, which, which, the, which we, the rationale for which we could debate, but uh, it's, not, it's not the true history of philosophy. And, and particularly Anglo-American philosophy suffers from the prejudice that unless you're just doing that kind of what is what looking at Leibniz for what is interesting from our point of view now, or, or treating Descartes as if he was uh, the, 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 the uh, in the same um, the, um, again for, the, for 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 what makes him interesting now, then um, uh, if if you're not doing that, then you're not doing history of philosophy. Everything else is history of ideas, and, into, and it, it makes for a terrible landscape of major and minor figures, and the minor figures all get swept into the history of ideas catalog because it's only uh, category because it's, it's only the um, it's only the um, crazy scholarly people who, who who bother with them. They obviously are the failures of 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 of, of, his, of history, so we don't need to take any account of them. But I'm fond of quoting, and I do quote it in, in my article in the Monist, I think, the uh, a quote from Richard Popkin, a historian of scepticism, who was actually very open to the idea of women philosophers, and he invited Mary Ellen Waite to, to, be, to contribute to his um, Columbia History of Philosophy back in the 90s. Um, and he, um, I think it's there where he says in the preface that he predicts that there will be as many histories of philosophy as 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 there, as there are interests in philosophy now, and and it, you can read that in different ways. But but I think he was being very prescient about the fact that as interests change, so we 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 think about well, what were the philosophers saying about that? And the two big areas now people are asking about are the women and the animals. I mean, animals is another big area in philosophy. And there is a history of philosophers writing about animals, and there are people doing that. So, um, to get to a, uh, so I, what I would like to see is is a, a, a getting to um, a more historical approach to get to get the thing started. Um, but it's it's in a sense taking a crisis to make that happen. Uh, um, we're told there is, we hear more and more, there is a crisis in the history of philosophy. Well, there is a crisis in the history of, in that kind of um, caricature history that I d described at the beginning. They're, they're just studying the, the figures, um, the historical figures, for, for, our, for our own sake now, because that doesn't do them a service and it doesn't do what. Um, it, does, it doesn't, uh, when I say what interests us now, it, I mean, it tends to be questions coming out. Th those very questions are already coming out of, of a very narrow area of, of philosophy. So 
open that up and then start thinking about how you write the history of it, you get a very different idea. And that's why bringing the women in is going to make a big difference. Um, if we can get there, but we've got to get there, um, but it'll only be part of the picture. Thank you. Next question, maybe? Thank you. Um, thank you for your contributions. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> this is awkward. Um, so thank you for your contributions. I'm going to use English because I don't speak German. Um, so you mentioned the difference between doing history or doing history of, intellectu of, of intele intellectual history. And then we, I think based on what you say, my opinion is that we not only have to rethink the, the uh, woman <coughs> role of the woman in canon, but the way we construct the canon. So until we uh, subscribe to those binary oppositions, such as minor and, mi minor and major figures, marginali marginalized figures and minor figures, uh, internal external reasons for canon exclusion and inclusion, we cannot uh, tackle the, the, the process of including women in the curriculum. So we have, to f uh, we have to settle for certain agenda, such as, okay, how do we understand the canon? Uh, because canon can be understood in different ways. You can go on the really micro level of talking about curriculum. We can talk about canon such as a philosophical relevance in a group of fellow philosophers, or we can talk about canon as a big geop geopolitical shift in, in uh, research agendas, right? And my focus uh, is on, the, on curriculum, uh, for example, of this, in this, with this question. So my question for you and for everybody here is if we could perhaps share some institutional practices in actually incorporating female authors in our curriculum. That can be in history of philosophy, philosophy of science, philosophy of neuroscience, any subject. Because what I, what, uh, I see and what, I, uh, what you uh, engage with in the practice is that often the reason why new authors are not added to curriculum is because professors know those texts really well, they've been teaching the same course for three, four years, and they don't, ha they don't want to do additional reading because they don't have time for that. That's one practical obstacle. Second obstacle is the heads of departments do not consider certain texts as philosophical, such as in situations with including Hannah Arendt in text. So there was situations in Netherlands that some dean said, oh, that's not philosophical enough. So that's the second obstacle. So I'm wondering how many of you have female authors on your curriculum in your teaching when, when you do your teaching and the rest here if you also have and if you have not what's the what is the obstacle and uh, if you have some institutional practices that have helped you to actually do that include those women in your curriculum so that's my question and thank you Also zum Curriculum, ähm, darf ich auf Deutsch bitte? Ja, ähm, also es gibt seit, glaube ich, jetzt drei Jahren an der Universität Wien ein postgraduales Studium für praktische Philosophie. Und ich war dort im ersten Semester für den Bereich ähm, Gesellschaft, also Philosophie in Gesellschaft und Kultur, das ist ja ähnlich. Und habe natürlich genau diesen Ansatz gehabt, weibliche Autorinnen reinzubringen. Ich habe den Begriff der Philosophie so definiert, denkende Frauen letztlich, also das habe ich nicht explizit so gesagt, aber rückwirkend sehe ich das so. Und es ist mir gelungen, diesen ganzen Kurs praktisch auf der Basis von, von Literatur von weiblichen Autorinnen mal zu konzipieren. Also das heißt nicht, dass wir das dann unbedingt genauso gemacht haben. Marx hätten wir nicht ersetzen können. Aber ich habe zum Beispiel den Ansatz gehabt, Komplexität war für mich ein sehr wichtiges Thema, der Umgang mit Komplexität, denn ich in allen Wissenschaft, Naturwissenschaften ist das ein Thema, Philosophie wahrscheinlich auch, im Alltag natürlich auch. Und da gibt es die drei wichtigsten Texte, die ich gefunden habe, waren von drei Frauen. Das ist aber jetzt nicht ins Curriculum eingegangen, sondern das war das erste Studienjahr. Und äh, inzwischen bin ich dort nicht mehr. Es macht also jeder sozusagen, wie sie oder er möchte. Aber es ist ein Beispiel, wie es möglich ist, äh, weil es inzwischen auch wirklich gute Literatur gibt. Die waren nur nicht eng definiert. Ja. 
Okay, I will just uh, briefly translate. So that was a comment uh, and a sort of reply uh, to this question uh, concerning the canon and how it is possible to integrate women philosophers and uh, that uh, referred to um, to a program, right, in practical, uh, in practical philosophy at the University of Vien Vien uh, Vienna. For the philosophy of practice, yeah, that was uh, in introduced th three years ago. Um, um, uh, and you uh, managed to conceptualize, uh, to, to outline uh, uh, the entire course is based on, on, on female authors, right? Uh, because there is now enough, so it's possible, right? There's a lot, a lot of um, publications around, and it's, uh, of course, sometimes you have. Uh, also to admit uh, women philo uh, male philosophers, for instance, Marx was obviously difficult to replace. <laughs> but on the other hand, there are issues like complexity, where especially to this topic of the concept of complexity, where especially women contributions were extremely valuable, so that the entire topic was covered only by um, women uh, authors. I also integrated Naval El Sadawi, who was an Egyptian uh, feminist, who had, has very good texts, and she wrote about uh, colonialism, mm. uh, about thinking, mm. uh, and how the thoughts are too much colonial. So yeah, I think we have to collect all this somewhere. <laughs> um, I will give this uh, any you know comments from your side somewhere here. Um. Ja, ich glaube, dass ich den, die erste Frage oder den ersten Kommentar nicht ganz äh, verstanden habe. Also es war eine Kritik am Curriculum, äh, ist das richtig? Die Frage ist auch, auch ja. also zu sagen, wie, wie können wir das machen? Die ja. Erfahrungen. ja, die Erfahrungen mit dem Curriculum, wenn ich lehre, als Professorin lehre, bin ich frei in dem, was ich lehre. Und selbstverständlich habe ich immer wieder dort, wo es sinnvoll war, möglich war, äh, für mich erreichbar war, immer auch Frauen mit integriert, einfach vom Thema her, also nicht separat. Das habe ich auch gemacht. Wir hatten in Merseburg äh, einen Gesprächskreis, den hatte ich installiert und zwar auch mit Kollegen, Kolleginnen äh, von, der, von unserer Hochschule, ein abendlicher Gesprächskreis, nur zum, zum äh, Thema Frauen dann auch noch äh, in der Wissenschaft. Aber ansonsten bin ich ja frei in der Lehre. Es wird also im Curriculum nicht festgeschrieben, jetzt welche Philosophen, sondern es werden sozusagen die, die, die Themen, nicht die Themenkreise, sondern die Disziplinen oder ja, das wird festgeschrieben. Wenn es mehr Frauen gibt in der Lehre, werden auch automatisch mehr Perspektiven von Frauen, Lebenswelten von Frauen, auch Frauen mit einbezogen in aller Selbstverständlichkeit. Und das ist eigentlich das, was, was mein Anliegen ist, diese Normalität einfach in, im Studium zu haben, die Normalität und nicht diesen Sonderbereich. Das ist wieder Frauenforschung, das ist wieder ein, ein Seminar nur zu Frauen und so weiter. Das ist vielleicht eine Übergangszeit, wo wir das brauchen. So, aber eigentlich das, was wir, was, was richtiger wäre, wäre diese Normalität. Und wenn ich als Frau lehre, suche ich mir das so aus, dass ich meine, dass ich den, es den Studierenden gegenüber gut verantworten kann. Okay, uh, I will try briefly uh, to um, uh, translate Maria's statement. So she referred to uh, um, the German uh, tradition uh, of, of freedom uh, of teaching. So, so once you uh, are in the lucky position to get a, a permanent position in Germany, you have an area uh, that, that you have to teach in, let's say ethics or uh, theoretical philosophy, but what you're actually teaching is up to you, right? So there's no one who can tell you, you have to teach this or that text. And so it happens as she is interested in, in having this more, you know, this interest in ancient philosophies. She always int uh, integrated women philosophers whenever it was possible in her research. And her point was also that if there were more women on permanent positions in the philosophy departments, then also much more women would be taught because these teachers would then select also much more, uh, because we can see it here, right? It's, uh, it's mostly uh, women philosophers with p positions who do the work and, and prepare editions, translations, and use women philosophers and, and engage in these discussions. And, and her wish for the future would also be that you know, that becomes normal, so that we don't have to make such a fuss about uh, women philosophers, but that there are just, you know, an equal amount of women philosophers on permanent positions that would cover, you know, all kinds of philosophy, philosophers that, um, created by men and by women. Yeah, this was more or less your point. Yeah. Sarah? Okay. Well, I'm, a, I'm not a very good example of experience with curriculum design because I'm now emerita and until I, when I, till I retired, and 
2016, it simply wasn't possible to teach women as part of the standard curriculum where I was. But um, I can say this, that I mean, it doesn't mean I haven't taught uh, about women uh, in, in other, other situations. But the, um, I will say uh, what, what, what important thing that's been raised here is differences of institutional practice um, across both within countries and, and in different countries. Um, and um, that there in, in some situations there is more scope for intervention in the curriculum without having to go through a whole institutional um, rigmarole. Um, uh, and another th a key thing is um, the, uh, the type of course it is. Um, and a colleague of mine at York, Tom Stoneham, before I went there, uh, did a course, got the, his department to agree to the, do a course on, on, uh, on women <coughs> philosophers. And he said there were not enough students signed up for it. And why? Because it was a voluntary course. It was there, it was available. It wasn't essential to their curriculum. And so it was regarded as, as, as um, it, 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 students just felt they, they didn't have time, but I think also they felt, probably felt that this was, this, because it was, it was like an optional extra, it was, um, it was uh, therefore perhaps not as important as, as, as the, the traditional curriculum. And um, you know, that's the kind of, that, that's changed now, but, 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 that, but that's the sort of problem one faces. Another important thing, of course, which you raise is, 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 is the, present, the availability of materials. You can't mount a course if you don't have materials. And a lot of the work that, that's ena been enabling for introducing women has been editorial work and translating work um, from the uh, Pythagoreans through to, to, to um, you know, the 19th and century, 20th century feminists. Um, just to make sure that, that there is something to, to teach. A, a paradox coming out of this is that the, the, for those philosophers for whom there are enough texts and who've been lucky enough to have come out in modern editions and translations have become the ones that are becoming the canonical ones. And for, for, the, for the 17th century, it's Con Conway and Cavendish are being taught all over the world. Uh, whereas Sor Juana, uh, for example, de la Cruz is, is, is not, uh, although she is being taught in, in some places. Hmm. Thank you. Any comments to this? Um. Uh, I just want to take up the point you made that the canon has to be constructed, and it is usually constructed from a certain perspective and from, from a certain um, range of interests. And I, I expect that with the sort of um, progress made in, for example, applied ethics in, uh, in, uh, in the phenomenology of everyday Lebenswelt um, categories, in the phenomenology of emotions, for example, and of psychological concepts in general, the proportion of women will be much higher than it is today. It depends in part uh, on the, the kind of uh, weighting you put on, on the philosophical disciplines. And traditionally, the weight was very much on metaphysics, on the most basic uh, a kind of, a kind of uh, inquiry, whereas metaphysics is now, has now become a rather specialized topic, mostly done by analytic philosophers, on a very linguistic uh, kind of uh, analysis. So it had lost its glamour, it has lost its central relevance to all other, to all other philosophical disciplines. I think we are in a transitional period where sort of everyday phenomena are entering much more than they used to uh, into the philosoph philosophical sphere, in, into the, uh, into the um, points of interest. And I think that there will be women on the canon in 50 years because in this field, women are now completely on a par with men. Uh, the normal thing, they, they are not predominant, but they are there. Uh, think of Martha Nussbaum, for example, or of the whole series of um, uh, women thinkers in uh, environmental ethics, in animal ethics, in, in things uh, or in the analysis of emotions. And in technology, ethics of technology, I'm not thinking of Ruth Hangruber, but of a lot of prominent Andersons, for example, in the philosophy of machine ethics, uh, these are quite uh, sort of um, futuristic programs, but I think they will raise much more interest in future than they do even now. And with the 
I think this is a, is a snow is a snowball project with the with the increase in numbers of shareholders uh, among women uh, who quote each other mutually and have a say in defining the curriculum then they have a say also in defining a completely different canon from what uh, we used to have. So sorry, but I would like to add something to that because I think uh, I want to point again to the revolutionary character because uh, in my eyes indeed we have a history a patriarch, uh, patri patriarchalized history which was subjected to some dominant ideas like, let's say, I repeat myself now, God is a male, which is a clearly nonsense idea, in contradictory to any philosophical and, yes, but incredibly potent. This is, and we have to see that we have put our philosophy on ideas like this. And there are women philosophers from 1622 who say, who says God is a man, is as stupid as, you know, and does not do a valuable philosophy. So I would like to point to, the, to, to this fact that when women do retrieve now their tradition, the tradition of women philosophers is a critical tradition in many points. It's not for the point because they are arguing as feminines, but th from the point of view and saying, what a stupidity, or when Du Chatelet, you know, taking up some arguments and saying, oh, when I'm reading Aristotle and Newton, there are as many sound ideas as absurdities. So it is not true that they can count for being the big things. And I think, it, and I indeed, I see this in my surrounding, that many males are very afraid that this established canon could get to, uh, into the move, you know. And I think indeed, and I would not under-evaluate that, that you have to be a bit of heroes when you're going through. Because it is, it's setting that through. So perhaps I'm talking about my own experience. I did also, because we are really indeed very free in Germany, and in the Anglo-American countries you can't imagine that. I did in 2012, my lecture in the history of philosophy was completely made out of women. And of course I think that a completely made out of women history of philosophy comes to a different end than a completely made out of it, canonized. And I'm pro-canon. I always would defend a canon because nobody reads everything. And it's not true that all texts are valuable, have the same depth and so on. Of course it's true that different times are in search for different topics. And so the canons are in a move. This is true. And this will be true also for the canons we create with women. Thank you. I would also like to just briefly comment on the questions of the challenges for, re -re -re for recreating the canon. And I would say concerning my uh, um, perspective, the most challenging thing is to convince my colleagues to go along uh, because for me it's not so difficult to integrate women in my teaching. So um, uh, although I said I, I was very modest on, on the bachelor's level, that's true, but on the, uh, on the master's level I, I just, I think it was this term, I um, uh, offered a course uh, uh, that had a uh, hundred percent female philosophers uh, uh, on the reading list. Uh, so that was also um, marked as historical from my colleagues <laughs> the first time uh, in the history of, of the University of Copenhagen. And that, that's possible on the master's level, right? So how to face this challenge to, to take your colleagues on board? So I think there are two things that were helpful for me. The one is we launched a gender policy. So we created a group for um, you know, the issue of women in philosophy. Uh, and there is some help around also from the British uh, Society of Philosophy. They gave out, you know, they have 
put on some recommendations for how to um, how to write such a gender policy for your philosophy department that relates to hiring processes, um, treating of female students, but especially also you know women on the syllabus, and and so we agreed on something there. It is modest still because we could not agree on a certain you know, amount of percent uh, of women philosophers, but still it's written, it's there, you can refer to this policy, that's helpful. And the second thing that is very helpful is, you know, you, the younger uh, colleagues uh, and the students, of course. So uh, if the students, especially the female students, raise their voice and say, we want to have this, uh, I, at least in my uh, department, I can say that had an impact because the voice of students still counts something, yeah. Okay, the, there were several um, questions uh, behind. Maybe I try to come up with a list. Um, yeah. yeah, just to uh, raise uh, one uh, thing that seems to be very pertinent is that there are some very damning, disparaging interpretation of women's subjectivity. Uh, mostly in some of the renowned philosophers. You can start with Freud's notion of historic, uh, historic woman. You can think about Laka's definition of a lack. And you can also think about uh, the uh, kind of a distinction that is made by cognitive scientists in terms of women's brain power and men's brain power. So you can see a deeply discriminating, almost uh, in lieu of a better word, do I call it racist, kind of an intervention that is coming as a counter trust to this attempt at uh, feminizing philosophy canon. And in terms of that, enough resistance and enough politics of knowledge is not done. Rather, in forming women's canon, a certain kind of cultural politics, a certain kind of voicing, projecting, articulating is kept as a strategy, while the strategy should have been deeper at the epistemic level, at the ontological level, just as Hannah Arendt or uh, Bouvier in terms of ethics of ambiguity and posing a counter ethical position would have done. So I would uh, bring to this, uh, to your notice, whether we can have an ethically alternative plank, a stronger ethical plank that re-articulates women's position in philosophy, and not just in terms of temporalities like ancient, modern, and contemporaries, but rather making a mix-up of all these in order to make a sheer voice which is unflinching, uncontaminable by the patriarchal designs. I want to add an aspect, um, and it's really a, an addition, it's not a contradiction to what uh, you are saying. I think it's not a good um, constellation to make a dualistic structure between male authors or male canon and uh, female authors. And for this, uh, one can open a third uh, perspective. I personally, I'm teaching Plato, I'm teaching Aristoteles, I'm teaching Kant, but I teach, I teach them in the perspective of Hannah Arendt. When I teach Plato, I teach Plato in the perspective of Hildegard von Bingen, Teresa von Avila, Simone de Beauvoir, E. Hannah Arendt. And this means, this is a decentering of the male canon without, um, um, ja, jetzt fällt mir das englische Wort, keine gute englische Formulierung ein, ohne sozusagen sagen zu müssen, Platon uh, ist nicht wichtig und ich lasse ihn jetzt einfach aus. And this is a, a practice I can do now directly and uh, it's, it's, uh, everybody understands, if you start with that, that this is a decentering of that what we are calling um, male tradition and all these uh, questions of footnote and heretic systems and so on. So, yeah. For, mm -hmm.
Ich werde jetzt erstmal Deutsch sprechen, dann kann ich das besser erklären. Und zwar ähm, sind ja auch hier in der Gruppe einige Studierenden vertreten, angehende Lehrkräfte. Und wir hatten vorhin die Diskussion mit dem Curriculum angesprochen. Es ist durchaus möglich, dass im Curriculum Möglichkeiten bestehen, äh, zusätzliche Personenkreise mit einzubeziehen. Also Freiräume sind gegeben. Nur das Problem ist halt, dass man frühestens in den, im Referendariat und vor allem auch in den ersten zwei Jahren der Lehrertätigkeit sich Gedanken darüber macht, welche Materialien sind für meinen Unterricht relevant. Und sobald da Selbstsicherheit herrscht, hört es dann auch schon auf. Die einzelnen Lehrkräfte haben in der Praxis kaum Zeit, zusätzlich zu erkunden, äh, sich zu erkundigen, was ist gerade in der Gegenwart relevant, welche Publikationen sind aktuell. Ähm, dann wird dann halt immer auf diesen allgemeinbindenden Kanon, also die typischen Klassiker Kant, Descartes, immer wieder zurückgegriffen, weil es da einfach viel Material zu gibt. Und wir, haben jetzt, wir sind jetzt hier versammelt und diskutieren darüber, dass es einfach zu wenig Frauen gibt, vor allem auch philosophische Werke von Frauen auch in der Schule dann auch angesprochen werden. Und es ist gut, diese Diskussion zu führen, aber wichtig ist es auch immer, nicht mit der Begründung zu sagen, weil es Frauen sind, müssen sie in den Unterricht aufgenommen werden, sondern weil das Werk oder weil die Leistung hervor, äh, hervorragt. Und ähm, es geht auch nicht darum, Kant oder Descartes oder die sonstigen Klassiker aus dem Unterricht zu verdrängen, weil ähm, deren Daseinsberechtigung ist durchaus gegeben und das ist auch über Jahrhunderte und Jahrzehnte auch immer wieder gut ähm, bewiesen worden, sondern es geht jetzt ja darum, wie kann man die Lehrkraft in der Praxis unterstützen und meines Erachtens als angehende Lehrkra Lehrkraft oder Referendarin bald ähm, ist es wichtig, mal aufzuzeigen, wie kann man Alternativen äh, zu Kant oder zu Descartes haben, wie kann äh, Hannah Arendt zum Beispiel, auch hier die Vorrednerin hat ja das ja exemplarisch aufgeführt, wie kann man halt Philosophie oder philosophische Themen aus anderen Perspektiven äh, betrachten. Und wenn man da jetzt einfach mal Arbeitsmaterial zusammenherzt, da man Netzwerke gründet, gerade jetzt auch im Hinblick der Digitalisierung, also es ist nicht zwingend erforderlich, das in die Literatur einzubringen, in die Schulbücher, weil die sind teilweise auch veraltet und werden auch gar nicht in der Praxis herangezogen, sondern dass man da halt so eine Community gründet und immer, wenn man was geschaffen hat, zum Beispiel Arbeitsmaterial, dass man das dann quasi der Community zur Verfügung stellt und dass sich das dann so quasi allmählich von Schule zu Schule ähm, verbreitet und dann halt permanent, permanent modifiziert wird. Und das kann man nur gemeinsam machen, wenn man sowas vorhat. Und vor allem, ähm, ja, wäre das dann halt auch mal so ein Ansatzpunkt. Und da ist jetzt meine Frage vor allem auch jetzt an, das, äh, an die Gäste, die heute hier sind. Was ist da jetzt praktisch schon versucht anzugehen? Also ich habe schon gehört, im universitären Kontext wird in der Lehre viel gemacht. Das habe ich jetzt auch in Paderborn an der Universität in diesem Semester festgestellt. Es gibt viele Kurse, wo dann philosophische Frauen äh, diskutiert werden. Aber wie sieht es im Hinblick in, die Praxis, in der Praxis aus? Wie gibt es da Hilfestellungen für Lehrkräfte, also für praktizierende Lehrkräfte, wie dann solche Philosophinnen im Unterricht aufgenommen werden können? Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm gonna try to speak in English. So um, I think that in Germany we have uh, some kind of an, a, a general problem of being op uh, of this openness to other philosophers, and it's not only like women philosophers, but also uh, very important philosophers like Muslim philosophers or Chinese philosophers who had great ideas. And I think that uh, that in German, uh, in the German canon, um, this lacks very much. And um, I hope that in future we can change this. So that will be great. Just to add to what you said and uh, the colleague that, that spoke about the, the matrix and what you mentioned about, uh, so I think that there is a fundamental difference between, for example, Copenhagen or for example, university, some of the universities in Netherlands in, in that that we have introduced the gender policies and that there is not, that it's not up to the professor, the tenured professor to decide on curriculum because the professor uh, can propose the curriculum, but it is up to the student body and to the whole organization, the whole department, to decide what is going to go in the syllabi. So I think that if we just rely on the solution that we need more women in the tenured position because then they are in the power and they are the one making choices, that, that's, that's, just, that's just supporting and perpetuating the, the power balance. And as you mentioned, that it's up to us, the younger generations, to do something about the gender policy and, and have impact on the syllabi that we are teaching. I don't think that will be an issue anymore, that, that it's all in the hand of the tenure professors. 
they are still respected and they have all everything that comes in the package, but the syllabi has to be diversified and that's, yeah, that's a... If, so my point has already been made by her, and I virtually agree with nearly every point she said, even though I think uh, in practice um, school books are used because as a teacher you have to prepare 25 minutes each uh, um, lessons each week and of course you go back to the textbooks that you have and you use them and you rarely find any, any uh, woman there. So maybe it's, it's a challenge for the next generation of school books um, to integrate more groups that are underrepresented and as you said not because they are women but because they are interesting persons and have interesting ideas. And this is just a challenge for us, the next generations of, of school books that are going to be published, I think. Maybe the last question? Um, yeah, so maybe a remark and a question. Um, the remark has to do with the participating of participation of students in changing the curriculum. Because I know from my own experience as a master student, I stumbled across uh, Madame de Stael all by coincidence because an art historian talked about it. I thought, well, that's interesting. So I wrote a paper on it for a class, and then I wrote a letter why I thought she should be part of the curriculum for that specific course instead of Chateaubriand. So that it's bottom up, very much possible. So I think if that would be part of the practice to encourage students to go and find and search because there's such a large amount of work to be done, I think it would be excellent to already use even like undergraduate students to do that. Um, so I think bottom up we can do a lot as well. Um, and also I um, have a open question because I had the opportunity with a f also a women philosopher of my department to give the very first lecture to all the new philosophy students and we were thinking about maybe also um, taking up this whole debate of women in the history of philosophy. So if you uh, or anyone has a good idea of how to use that very first impression in order to make a good impression for these students to be passionate about this as much as we are. Um, yeah, recommendations would be uh, very great. So. Okay, uh, so the, these were a lot of uh, comments made. Uh, are there any responses here? Yeah. So first, um, I think really um, I have tried many ways and something uh, I could recommend to you. I was a philosophy teacher for 10 years at the University of Cologne, which has the most philosophy students in Germany, about four to 5,000. And, um, and I started to read uh, texts anon anonymously. So, uh, but this is the really difficult thing is, because I think it's wonderful that you are optimistic and you say, oh, we read Descartes, it's important, and, um, and history has proved it is important. It's wonderful, you know, so, um, and to think that there might be an objective measure of an objective good text, and it's not important if it is from a, written by a woman or a male. So this is this will be changed perhaps by experience. But um, so um, I thought also that reading texts uh, anonymously would be a very good experience, also to bring women in. And, uh, but you have to have a very, very good knowledge of the history of philosophy really to bring text examples in that you can compare. There was one lesson here, we have discussed that already, uh, with the English, with the O'Reilly and so on. It's not so easy simply to say, okay, I take this text and another text and so on. To make fit fitting really how to approach certain problems from that perspective or from other perspective. But that do you have to be really um, yeah, very, very fond of. Then the next question is, so, um, I indeed, I have uh, developed my first book to the, for, the, uh, for the use of uh, teachers in 96 to 98. 
And uh, immediately it should go to the publisher and so on. It's not published up to now. We often thought that we, it's really, it's only text pieces for teachers. And it's very, it's an, uh, and we will put that online so the teachers can withdraw the text and so on. But then making the text fitting in into, I did in 98 a book on classical texts of women philosophers, very much according to the model of Herstal, you know, classical texts of political philosophy. And so my book was uh, um, uh, retailed very much according to this. And indeed, many of these texts, because I know that, have been taken over from Schultz books, like Olympe de Gouche has always been reprinted from my book. Nobody has, however, taken N. Conway, which was also the first translation as well as from Cavendish in our book. But nobody took Conway, I don't know why. You know, although we have written, this was very influential, and if you want to understand Leibniz, read Conway, because it was an influential text for the monadology and so on. And it is very interesting, so, and at the end, one. Yeah, so there are many political mechanisms, and it is wonderful. We are here a troop of people who um, understand ourselves and we know how it could be. But I think we should not forget that uh, the wider audience is still thinking differently. Yes, and it is really a different question how do we take them? I've just a comment on the institutional points. I'm, uh, earlier this year, I was a member of a board that had to, to evaluate the Dutch uh, philosophy institutes, and I was very much impressed by the legal standards in adjusting the contribution of multiculturalism and multigenderism, as it were, uh, even to subjects uh, like uh, philosophy. And this is really a norm uh, that is very strict. And people have to respond. The institutes have to respond in some way, in some plausible way. And this exerts a certain kind of pressure on uh, giving women tenured positions and to, uh, to actually support their efforts to uh, make a career, to get a career, because they need that support in this transitional period. And the same is only insufficiently done in Germany. <clears throat> there is very little pressure in that. Uh, I mean, most, most of the, the activities, the initiatives uh, of, uh, of promoting uh, women in students, in assistant, and in, uh, on all levels are voluntary. They are supported by the university, but there is no pressure from above. <clears throat> and of course, these, uh, for example, mentoring, um, uh, uh, mentoring uh, groups and so on are really important because my experience is that women on all these levels are much more uncertain about their quality. Um, they have much, many more self-doubts, they have a more realistic and more skeptical self-evaluation. Uh, and, and, and yeah, it, it is really the case. They are so much more reasonable than uh, many uh, male members of the same levels are, uh, that they have um, a deficit in um, sort of encouragement. And in groups, it is much easier to get this encouragement in informal groups than by uh, one's own desperate efforts. But there could be more promotion from above, uh, not perhaps necessarily on this very strict level as the Dutch do, because this is a, is a bit um, sort of uh, totalitarian, it's very authoritarian, well-meaning, but uh, of course it meets with resistance. Um, of course, but, but um, I would be happy if in all universities these activities would, a bit mat, mat, uh, would be promoted a bit more. Thank you. Any comments here on, on, on the things that were said uh, from the audience? 
Okay, einmal äh, zu der Bemerkung jetzt, dass wir äh, innerhalb der Philosophie jetzt der europäischen Philosophie bleiben oder die Deutschen bleiben innerhalb der deutschen Philosophie und dann gerade die Ethik erweitert sich dann noch so im englischsprachigen Raum, dass wir also chinesische Phil Philosophie oder asiatische äh, nicht mit aufnehmen. Das ist die Frage eben, was wir unter Philosophie verstehen, was also dazugehört oder nicht, eben dieses erweiterte Denken oder andere Denken, andere Denkmöglichkeiten. Ähm, wir sind da noch sehr geschlossen und wir, sind, wir haben auch die Schwierigkeit, dass wir einfach die Texte da nicht haben und dass wir sie auch nicht übersetzen können. Und auch in dieses andere kulturelle Denken müssen wir erst mal hineinfinden. Das ist also noch mal so ein Schritt, der sicherlich nicht so einfach ist. Nämlich wir können, also wir müssen diesen, innerhalb des Kulturraumes denken wir ja, verstehen wir ja. Und dann müssen wir uns für diesen Kulturraum öffnen, das können wir sicherlich, aber es ist ein Prozess, es dann auch wirklich zu verstehen. Ich fände es gut, wenn es gelingen könnte, aber das ist noch in unserer Tradition, glaube ich, ein weiter Weg. Aber im Zusammenhang damit fiel mir dann auch ein, jetzt in den 80er Jahren gab es innerhalb der Ethik die Diskussion um die Fürsorgeethik, die Gerechtigkeitsethik. Nuna Winkler hatte den Sammelband herausgegeben und dann Beate Rössler war beteiligt und dann war diese Frage, was ist eigentlich wichtig? Die Fürsorgeethik von Frauen praktiziert, einfach weil sie ja für die Fürsorge per, Auf, per, per Zuweisung Arbeits oder Aufgabenzuweisung zuständig sind für die Beziehungen und so weiter oder die Gerechtigkeitsethik. Und die Diskussion verlief dann nach, ja, ich weiß nicht, so zwei, drei Jahren verlief sie dann so im Sande, weil die Gerechtigkeitsethik, auch gerade wie, wie äh, Aristoteles sie in der Theorie dann ausformuliert hatte, so viel bedeutsamer ist für die Gesellschaft insgesamt, für die Welt überhaupt. Während die Fürsorgeethik eben ja im Kleinen, im Unmittelbaren, im Direkten dann auch äh, die Bezugsgröße ist innerhalb nicht noch noch nicht mal der Familie, sondern einfach in der auf der Ebene der der Beziehung der Menschen der Beziehung untereinander. Aber beides hat eben eigentlich gleichermaßen äh, ist notwendig, ist gerechtfertigt und es ist wichtig auch beides zu äh, diskutieren, zu hinterfragen, weiterzuentwickeln und nicht diese Hierarchie. Das ist für den großen politischen, gesellschaftlichen Bereich zuständig und das ist sozusagen auch theoretisch untermauert und das andere gut bezieht sich auf die Praxis, also ist es auch gar nicht so äh, wichtig oder schwierig oder äh, so zu vermitteln. Die Diskussion ist im Sande verlaufen, habe ich so in Erinnerung, sondern die Gerechtigkeitsethik im traditionellen Verständnis hat dann... Äh, Gesiegt. Ich habe es nicht weiter verfolgt, aber ich weiter, was Beate Rostler ist nach Amsterdam gegangen, weil sie hier keine Professur bekommen hat. Also die Frauen sind dann sozusagen, haben sich anderweitig orientieren müssen, weil sie hier nicht, nicht Fuß fassen konnten, so glaube ich. Not sure if I <laughs> followed everything here. Um, so Maria made two points. The one is a comment on, uh, on German philosophy and it's concentration or its focus uh, on the German tradition, maybe the European tradition, then maybe the Anglo-American tradition, uh, but it's still very much in the beginning when it comes to multiculturalism and, and to the openness towards Asian or African Uh, philosophies, although we must say, well, Leibniz, I mean, uh, already in the 17th century and earlier on, you know, there were people around who, who reached out. So, so it is weird and very odd that the 20th century uh, or maybe the 90s as well were restricted, were, were so nationalistic and so Eurocentristic. Um, and the, we still suffer in Germany from this, right? So, so we have actually to do very basic work, um, language um, skills have to be inquired, traditional um, translational work and, and so on. So it's a long way still, I think that was your point. And uh, the other uh, point concerned um, a debate that took place in, in ethics concerning uh, the ethics of care and the ethics of justice and this debate between which is more might be more important and and if I understood you correctly that that was kind of a lively debate uh, although then in the end it seems that in the German context at least the justice paradigm kind of <laughs> won uh, because it seemed to be much more important for the uh, the political context whereas the ethics of care is something related you know, to actually what, what, what women do in their daily life every time and, and it's much more personal and private and that, that and maybe for that was reason it was devaluated and not uh, taken up so seriously and, and people who were working on this did not even get positions in Germany and had to leave and, and take positions somewhere else. So um, I don't know if I said it, well, okay. Uh, Sarah, thank you. 
Well, just a couple of quick comments on, on how to wow your students. I think all you need to do is, I, I mean, you'd be trying to wow them anyway, but if, if women are in there at the very beginning, then that becomes the new normal. So, um, uh, and that also sets a marker and a challenge to teachers f further, up, further up the degree. So I mean, that's as much as a bit, of, you know, I'm sure other people give you more concrete advice. But we, we're, we're oscillating here between both institutional uh, questions and, and, and curriculum questions. Um, let me say I applaud the fact that here in Germany, uh, philosophy is taught in schools. Um, in, in England, we're far behind. The Scots are ahead of the English on this, but only marginally in, Scottish, uh, in, in Britain the, 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 in schools the philosophy is still rel relatively marginal and this is illustrated by the fact that when about 10 years ago the British Philosophical Association was set up um, they, they, they were very hostile I was on the committee and they were very hostile to having school teachers as part of the organisation luckily that's all changed I mean it's completely changed now and there is a drive to get philosophy into the into the curriculum, but it'll be in the it'll be in the voluntary side of the curriculum, not the not the the core national national curriculum, uh, and it is it is being taught, but it tends to be taught in the private schools rather than in the in the general state schools. So that's a, that's another class problem we have. Um, but there, I'll just tell you about a, a, a very effective, and this I'm afraid it's the top down uh, solution, but it's an economic solution. Um, um, the in science a, a, an initiative. Um, was introduced called Athena Swan, and uh, basically the, the, the we're public public education, of course. Uh, ministries said that unless the um, the grant giving organisation said unless si science departments, in order to qualify for funding, science departments have just got to get their act together about, about the way um, about women's careers in in their departments, and they'd got to be able to they'd got to go for what was called an Athena Swan award, and this was there was gr gold silver and bronze and you had to get that to get all the funding it wasn't just that you know you may have the the, the world's leading um, um, uh, authorities on, on on astrophysics but you're not going to get the funding if your department is totally um, all the professors are male and none of the, the and all the all the the research assistants are female um, at this had a magic effect an absolutely magic effect they clicked their heels and they really got on with it um, and they strove for it. Um, they panicked, and and it, it it of course overnight women didn't become professors, but they, they it set it on the road. And and I know because I did mentoring on this. Um, they didn't have enough women in the sciences to mentor, so they asked senior women in other parts to come, part of the university to come in and help. And I know from that the women were, um, you know, they've been they've been for years doing the 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 drudgery uh, um, and and not and and. Uh, struggling to get published and all of this and and that that finally it was this log jam finally changed and it was so successful that it was decided to roll it out in the humanities and now that is being done I would however add a note of caution because I know a department uh, a school in Cambridge and I'll name it it's the School of Divinity and they were going for the Athena Swan Award and they uh, um, everyone's going for it and I know that there's stuff going on there. They know how to get around these things. They, they, there's book fiddling that goes on, basically. You know, you really, really have to be, um, it, and it's, it's a bit easier to do it, I'm afraid, in the, in, in the humanities. So, so, so you can have all sorts of systems in place, um, and, and things still, get, uh, still get, don't get done right. So I think my, I, my, part of my solution is, is bring back skepticism. Skepticism has gone out of fashion in the history of philosophy, but so make you sure you get skepticism in there in your, so that skepticism to challenge dogmatism, dogmatism of any kind, and, and roll out the, those philosophers, and I'm afraid some of them might be men, but you know, roll them out to, 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 to teach the argument. I'm sure you can pick up, I'm, I'd be very interested to hear more about um, ancient skeptical women, if, there, if, the, if, if you have any, any um, evidence of that. But, but, but basically, there is, you, know, you will find women using skeptical arguments. But that skeptical view is something which I think we, we, we really, we, we really, um, we're really deeply in need of in this, this age of dogmatisms, dogmatisms old and new. Thank you. Shall we take another round of uh, questions? 
That's wonderful. I just have two questions. The first one is, I really uh, would like to hear from you, uh, how do you address the objections that goes like this? Uh, the history of uh, the recovery of women in the history of philosophy or the history of philosophy with women on it, it's not feminism, it's not uh, feminism or it's a kind of a, a mis disguised feminism. The real thing is the queer theory. I'd like to know, I'd like to hear you about that approach and each of you, because this is something kind of a uh, zeitgeist that we deal with inside Brazilian uh, philosophy courses, that we are just misleading the thing, the real thing is the rape inside the campus and racism inside the classes and so forth. And, um, and, and the other stuff is, <laughs> the other question, I'm sorry, is regarding this skepticism because we have so much to do, and I, I wonder, uh, what do you mean about the idea regarding method, uh, about uh, this possibility of a, a conference on feminism or a, as a kind of a skepticism? The feminism or the recovery of a woman in philosophy as a, an expression of a contemporary skepticism to, to look for and to, to push this agenda as a kind of skepticism, to think, uh, thinking about that as an expression of contemporary or historical, if I may put it in this way, or methodological skepticism. Is it? Is that? Maybe we collect if there are other questions. Uh, yeah, we Oh, thank you for the uh, nice panel discussion. Um, I still have some uh, question to uh, the motivation of the uh, canonized uh, philosophy. Uh, uh, we are uh, actually uh, try to uh, rewriting the history of philosophy uh, from the women's view uh, in this context. But how it goes to the outsider of philosopher, uh, philosophies, so that uh, uh, how about the interdisciplinary uh, context? Because uh, some people outside of philosophy talking about the philosophy something, but uh, they are also uh, already refer to the uh, existing canon like the phenomenalism uh, uh, in general, Husserl or whatever, Plato or whatever. Uh, so they have the uh, 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 uncritically accept the existing canon. How can we uh, then uh, say promote this kind of movement going on in the philosophy community then? So the multicultural issue is of, of course important, but at the same time, we need to the contemporary view about the ne for the next generation to uh, how to promote this movement outside of philosophy community. Thank you. Um, I have a quite practical question. Um, for we all are those dwarfs that are standing on the shoulders of giants, you know. And um, I have realized these days that I have for a very long time not questioned that most of these giants are male giants. And um, no, I'm I'm standing here and I'm uh, thinking about yeah, um, how can I create more female giants out there for students to stand upon? And um, I really thank you for the suggestions that you just made. And um, it seems that um, one thing where I can contribute is um, to to put those female philosophers on my text lists for my seminars. And now the questions I have is. Um, if I did so, what do I do, do I do during the lecture? Do I draw the attention to the fact that there may be less women philosophers um, possible for me to to um, to contribute in this in this text list because there there are just a few texts reachable for me? Um, and draw also so the attention to the fact that women have been underrepresented in the history of philosophy, or do I just read their text to normalize the fact that 
I do so. So what would you think? Yeah. Um, I guess this is a question to all of you. So you said that, well, it's not reason enough just to say that there were women, so they should be included. Well, I think that, yeah, it might not be the only reason for including them, but why isn't it enough that they are women? And the same question I asked to you, because I got the impression that this um, whole center and these research projects on women in philosophy are like motivated, as you also said, from like um, our environment, the society. And I don't think that the, uh, the history of philosophy and philosophy in general Will, will survive if we don't take the problems of representation seriously. Um, so yeah, that's one question. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stick with that for now. So do you agree with like uh, text being written by women being reason enough to include them? Um, Ich bin jetzt müde, deswegen werde ich erstmal Deutsch sprechen. Sorry. Ich möchte in dieselbe Richtung. Ich möchte, äh, ich habe das Gefühl, ähm, zu, zu diesen Äußerungen von, ähm, vielleicht ist es irgendwann nicht mehr notwendig, äh, über Autorin zu reden, es zählt nur noch die einzelne Person, äh, dass das äußerst problematisch ist. Das ist eine Art von Metaphysik oder Positivismus, den ich für sehr problematisch halte. Ähm, ich möchte etwas dagegen setzen. Die Frage nach dem Kanon ist eine Frage danach, wie wir uns historisch orientieren durch Tradierungspraktiken. So könnte man das übersetzen. Und diese Tradierungspraktiken funktionieren nicht mehr. Das ist die eine Seite. Die andere Seite ist, dass Frauen, wenn sie in der Geschichte, das ist, ich fange so an, dass es Frauen, unbestimmter Plural gibt, die sich für Frauen in der Geschichte interessieren, unbestimmter Plural für Frauen in der Geschichte, und zwar deswegen, weil sie selber eine gehaltvolle historische Existenz haben wollen. So. Und damit haben wir sozusagen zwei Momente, die aufeinandertreffen, nämlich auf der einen Seite, was heißt Kanon als Orientierungshilfe und auf der anderen Seite das Bedürfnis von Frauen, und das ist was anderes nochmal und eine Ergänzung zum Skeptizismus, das Bedürfnis von Frauen, eine gehaltvolle historische, das heißt eine gehaltvolle politische, historische, eine gehaltvolle philosophische, historische, eine gehaltvolle sprachliche, historische Existenz zu haben. So. Und dieser Punkt darf nicht neutralisiert werden, davon bin ich persönlich überzeugt, denn das nimmt den Frauen ihre historische Existenz, beziehungsweise die Möglichkeit, dass diese gehaltvoll gewesen sein könnte. I just maybe briefly summarize the, the last point in English. Um, um, it was about uh, uh, some skeptical concerns uh, concerning giving up the categories uh, of woman uh, and, and, and gender in the history of philosophy uh, as uh, making it superfluous or redundant to talk about it and having a special interest in the, in the history of women's thought. Um, because if I understood you correctly, um, uh, women, uh, we as, as for instance historians of female, female historians nowadays uh, are in need also of you know um, a substantial history uh, of, for our own. So so we have to be. Uh, they are longing for that's the difference. They are longing for. Uh, we we also yeah we are all longing for this. <laughs> well uh, probably we disagree uh, on on that point, but that doesn't matter. So that was your point, right? So that we are in uh, need and and are longing for this. So um, it's important not to say all. Yeah. Okay. This is the metaphysical structure. I uh, I'm criticizing. I'm saying women. This is a non-determined plural. Okay. So good. So these were a lot of questions and comments. Anyone uh, dare to start with <laughs> some? I think it's the last round. Yeah. 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 So I'm happy to start with uh, some kind of conclusion to that, and also to respond perhaps to the variety and the variety i think it was really a very 
fruitful discussion, a fruitful discussion which has also uh, shown the variety of responses to the problem, dependent on the ages, the backgrounds, and so on. And um, um, in um, so for me, indeed, after having worked for such a long time in this field, um, and having started also with the idea there is something which is philosophy and which is not dependent on the sexes. Indeed, I still hold that. And indeed, in my last talk, I said the first question is a philosophical question. And the philosophical question is not a sexist question. The problem is, and I am afraid to understand, that so many have not yet understood, and I again insist in saying that, that the history of philosophy we are facing is a sexist history. This is the problem. The sexist problem problem is not on the women's side. The sexist problem is on a certain cultural development which has presented itself in a sexual interest, in a patriarchalizing interest. This is the problem. And this is the reason why I say, and I hold this very strongly, that the women philosophy and the research for women philosophers is a necessary critical undertaking to improve philosophy. So it's not a sexist going into philosophy. However, doing the history of women philosophers is a very important methodological instrument to improve philosophy, which has shown and presented itself in many parts as a sexist one. And it is very interesting that many women philosophers from the early beginnings on make this difference. Oh, this is a good philosopher. He did not look after the sex if this woman, if this uh, uh, philosophy has been uttered by a woman or not. So I think, and this is the term that you all have to get, to get. So the sexist page is not the feminine, the, on the woman's page. The sexist page is the history we have uh, uh, survived up to now. And so when uh, Sarah says this is a um, skeptical view into dogmatism, yes, so, so I, I would say it is the critical. We have to renew philosophy. I really think that there are many views. So I, I would not teach Descartes. I've really think it's in many ways. So there are many, many important texts at that time. Perhaps I would teach Descartes, uh, so there might be some, but his malignance, of, but we don't want to go into detail. And you first have to get a very good knowledge of the text from women philosophers before you can decide if you would think to keep on Descartes. So first show me that you have a very good knowledge of the history of philosophy, of a complete history of philosophy, and then we decide if you think you still need Descartes or not, or in what respect you will need it. And uh, going back also to, you know, the point is, um, I always, uh, I think that the bringing in the women is one critical approach to a sexualized history of philosophy. And this is also true, of course, for other cultures. And I assume that the, we ha the philosophical idea is the universalist idea. I say that. Is the universalist idea, and surely it is not confined to the European idea. It is interesting, however, that different cultures develop different kinds of philosophical approaches. And it is really interesting, and a friend of us, Karen Green, says that the idea of liberty, which brands the Western philosophy, and for Karen Green, she says this idea, in no culture where the women are much more suppressed than in the Western culture. This 
idea of liberty has not developed, but these are cultures that have developed ideas of community and so on. And I think all these aspects have to be regarded as very, very carefully. There is such a huge work in front of us. And uh, yes, so I think it is, so the, this kind of philosophy is one kind of critical philosophy, and there are so many other kinds of critical philosophy that have to come out before this world is going to flourish or function. Yeah, this was a rather basic uh, <laughs> point you made, but I fully agree. Um, we don't need women in philosophy because they are women but because uh, they are put forward different perspectives from what we know from philosophy. And one part of this uh, somewhat typically female perspective is, as you said, I think, a more skeptical attitude, an anti-dogmatic uh, attitude, and this might be, in fact, an improvement of philosophy. In reading Descartes, I was struck by his dogmatism, yes, and uh, that, 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 was my, that was my initial yeah. uh, uh, impulse. Uh, I thought that his female correspondents had much more good sense yeah. and were much more rational than this rather stubborn rationalist thinker. And uh, I think this can be a very healthy influence on the quality of philosophy. And, and therefore, I think normality is that both perspectives come together and are complementary. Yeah. Thank you. I will also take the opportunity to just briefly comment uh, on one issue um, concerning the gender um, part and how important it is to keep it and to you know, put emphasis on the fact that some are women and some are not. And uh, I personally uh, as said, I think I said it also this morning, um, I awaked at some point, right? <laughs> Until this point, I was just a human being. And I just thought, well, I was interested in philosophy. And at a certain point, I realized, way. Uh, I, I can't hear my voice if I raise it in a seminar room because, you know, um, my female uh, fellow students won't listen to me and even, you know, the professor won't. And then I started reading textbook and all these stories came up and I, I realized, well, I'm living in a different world, it's the same experience that you had and I said, well, we have to address this. And I think uh, th that ex experience uh, repeated in many of us. Um, and, and one who made, you know, uh, kind of developed also a met methodological approach out of it, that's, uh, that's Londa Schiebinger. I mean, she's so important, and not just for the history of philosophy, but for the history of sciences. And she had also this political impact because she was a consultant for the United Nations and also for the Euro uh, European Research Council. And for the European Research Council, she prepared also uh, this issue about, about gender in research. And she made there a distinction between three different approaches to the topic, and the one she called the, the neutrality approach. So, so we are just, you know, in philosophy, that's common for us. We care for truth, <laughs> right, for objectivity. We don't care for these contingent factors as race or uh, gender or whatever. Um, so that was the approach that was, you know, um, uh, uh, the, the leading paradigm for a very long period in philosophy. And we realized what was the outcome. The outcome was the expulsion of women, uh, of uh, the white, uh, the white Western, uh, the white, you know, uh, men was then the philosopher. Also the Jewish tradition, the Muslim tradition, um, black philosophers, um, women, they were excluded. So, so that, that cannot be the road to go on further, right? Uh, and then she distinguished the second approach, which she called the, the difference approach, which was very common in, in, in feminism uh, in the 70s and 80s, where women philosophers stood up and said, well, there has been something else in history. We have to rewrite history because women are differently. We have different values. We have different, you know, we have a different nature and we care. We have, a, yeah, um, uh, for instance, an ethics of care and they made this essentialistic claims about women's nature that, but also to bring in these values and these people who were excluded. But of course, as we all know that this position has very 
big pitfalls because we don't want to be essentialized in this way, right? Uh, as, as women or men. And then Londa uh, Schiebinger comes up very cleverly, I think, with this third, <laughs> um, all, all good things are three, uh, with the third approach, which she calls equality through gender analysis. So don't close your eyes for, to the difference of gender. But of course, our goal is equality, but we have to go through it, yeah? We have to pinpoint to the fact that women were excluded and we have to bring them in. And once they are in, of course, we don't, once equality is established, we don't have to uh, uh, p t um, take up these gender categories any longer, but that's the goal, not the starting point. We should never pretend women were never excluded. And bringing women in and making them part of everyday teaching of philosophy is a great ideal. But we should never allow that to become the new normal. Uh, so you may put Anne Conway on your curriculum, you may put Hannah Arendt on your curriculum, but you've got to know, you, you've got to somehow make sure that, that it's understood that they couldn't uh, they, I mean, even if things have, were worse in the 19th century, they weren't that wonderful in the 18th, never mind the 17th. I mean, it, women have had a tough time, and one reason why there aren't so many texts for women is that, um, is that they, their texts weren't preserved, even, even when they did write them. So um, uh, one reason why there are fewer is that, that, that history hasn't been kind. But, so we do need a new history of philosophy, a, a, a history of philosophy which reevaluates the men. I mean, if you think of Descartes, he wasn't he wasn't lauded for his being a philosopher of consciousness in the in the in the seventeenth century, though some people did take take that up. He was lauded as as, as this new scientific theorist, and and he went up and down. He was put on the index and uh, the Catholic Church, and and he had his 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 heyday. And if you if you trace through when Descartes becomes the sort of king of, of philosophy, it, I mean, it's post-Hegelian, it's, it's, it, it too is historically contingent. Um, but I agree with Ruth, at the end of the day, it's the philosophy that matters. And it, wh wherever it's coming from, it's, it's the philosophy that matters. But it is very important to get the women in there. And in a, certainly in a transitional period, there is a case for bringing in women because they are women. And, and, and the ones that we are getting notice of are good women who, according to the, 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 even the fellows of all souls, would have to agree that women can be uh, as, uh, um, they say, oh, we can't have equal, we, we have as, we have, all souls is, is the most traditional Oxford college, uh, it's a graduate college, which says we, 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 we're not prejudiced against women. I mean, just straight, you know, textbook Schiebinger stuff. Um, the, we, no, we only take the best here, only, 10% women on their fellowship, interesting that. And, but getting the women in there, so this point about l outside looking in, I think it's a, it's a very important one because it, the outside looking in and seeing uh, this strange discipline where somehow women don't belong, is, it makes it even more um, irrelevant uh, to the world outside. But so putting the women in there is going to make a huge difference and um, uh, uh, and I mean, it's already making a, 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 a huge difference. So we really do need, um, we really need to do, to, to take the history of philosophy apart and put it back together again so that we can, we can rebuild it and, and philosophy together. Gut, ähm, es fällt mir jetzt etwas schwer, noch, ähm, noch weiter etwas dazu zu sagen, aber mir ist etwas ähm, an, an Erlebnis in Erinnerung. Ich bin 1993 von Aachen in die neuen Bundesländer gegangen, nach Sachsen-Anhalt und äh, sofort innerhalb der ersten Wochen, Monate war eigentlich klar, wie schwer die Verständigung ist. Wir haben also über den Menschen gesprochen. Und ich hatte ein humanistisches Menschenbild, aber jetzt in der Tradition der DDR war ein natur naturwissenschaftliches Menschenbild. Und wir haben, also ich habe eine ganze Weile gebraucht, um überhaupt das äh, aufdecken zu können. Wir sprachen Deutsch, wir sprachen alle zusammen Deutsch. Wir benutzten einfach Mensch und Frau und Mann und Freiheit, Gerecht, Gerechtigkeit. Wir meinten ganz verschiedene Dinge. Und wir haben, wir haben wirklich darum gerungen, uns zu verstehen, was wir denn jeweils meinen. Und wir haben einfach zusätzliche Erklärungen immer wieder gebraucht, Beispiele gebraucht. Um, äh, dann, und wir wollten, wir waren von 
allen Seiten bemüht, uns eben zu verständigen. Wir wollten verstehen. Und in diesem äh, gemeinsamen Bemühen ging es dann auch. Dann haben wir uns verständigt und wir haben akzeptiert, dass es diese verschiedenen Menschenbilder gibt oder diese Verständnisse. Und ich halte das eben auch für eminent wichtig, wir müssen die Philosophiegeschichte neu schreiben, in, in diesem Versuch zu verstehen, aus welcher Zeit heraus, aus welcher Perspektive heraus, aus welcher Lebenswelt heraus äh, wir was gedacht haben, Frauen gedacht haben, Männer gedacht haben oder in welchen Kontexten sie gedacht haben. Wenn wir bemüht sind zu verstehen, dann können wir die Geschichte auch um wesentliche Punkte erweitern. Und zwar wesentliche Punkte an Denkmöglichkeiten. Denkmöglichkeiten über diese Welt, über, diese, über uns Menschen, über Beziehungen und so weiter. Es, und äh, anders ist es, glaube ich, auch nicht möglich, äh, wenn wir nicht wollen, dass es einfach so parallel läuft. Ne? Die Geschichte der Philosophinnen und die Geschichte der Philosophen und dann kann man es dann zusammenwürfeln und dann haben wir mal den Text und mal den Text. Sondern es geht eigentlich um dieses bemühen, dass wir uns verstehen und in diesem Verstehen dann jeweils auch das Eigenrecht der eigenen Lebenswelt oder des eigenen Kontext dann auch so akzeptieren. Und dadurch wird unsere Welt eigentlich, oder für mich persönlich war es eine sehr große Bereicherung, einfach so diese andere, dieser andere kulturelle Hintergrund zu, ja, zu lernen, daraus zu lernen. Die Schwierigkeit war, wir sprachen alle Deutsch und wir gingen davon aus, wir sprechen Deutsch und wir können uns verständigen. Und das war der große Fehler. Wir haben anderes gedacht bei den, bei, in der Sprache, die wir benutzten. Yeah, good. Okay, uh, I tried to translate. So Maria started uh, with an uh, anecdote from her own life uh, um, about the, the problems of understanding. So she, she moved from Aachen to, um, to, east, to part of Eastern Germany, which has previously um, been the DDR. Um, And she started with her colleagues to debate about the human being. What is the human being and how do we understand uh, what, 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 what is the defining features of humans? And they started to discuss and then they realized, although they all spoke German, they not at all understood each other because they had concepts that had completely different impacts. She got a humanistic uh, education and her colleagues there had a more, you know, education based on, on scientific research and natural sciences and, and naturalistic understanding. So um, th th it took some time for them to understand that they can't, cannot understand each other. And then it was important that all of them had the will to understand how does it come from that you think in that way and, and what is the, the benefits maybe and the pitfall of the different positions. And she thinks that this kind of experience has to be translated also to the, to the way we deal with the history of philosophy. So, so we have to see why it is uh, that Uh, for instance, women philosophers were excluded, which strategies were followed, but also uh, what women uh, published in their times out of which perspective and questions. And she thinks it's important to develop these different perspectives and try to understand them so that we avoid to have parallel histories, right? That we have a history of philosophy somewhere and then the history of women philosophers somewhere else. But we have to bring them both together um, through this will of understanding, if I understood this correctly. I think that was a very nice, uh, actually, um, um, clothing point uh, of our discussion. So thank you all very much for contributing. Thank, uh, thanks to our panelists uh, for being here. And, and if I understood correctly, we, we still have some wine downstairs. Yes. Thank you very much. I think it was a wonderful discussion. and. I think um, it is wonderful when we will have it online. So, you know, entering here the center means being in the media. But this is the future, sight and sound and philosophy. Thank you very much. Thank you.